Welcome to Africa's LSP podcast, where we explore the world of translation, interpretation, and localization, as well as connect with the language industry's top players. From language service providers to the businesses and individuals who rely on their services, we'll be delving into the challenges, opportunities, and trends shaping the industry. Join us as we discover the power of language and the impact it has on connecting Africa and the world. Brought to you by Bolingo Consult and hosted by Nat Kintela, Africa's LSP podcast is the go-to podcast for all things language in Africa. Welcome, language enthusiasts, to another episode of Africa's LSP podcast. For those who do not know, this week marks the Kwekwe Language Week for 2023. And as such, we are dedicating today's episode to celebrating the Kwekwe language, culture, and heritage. Um, joining us to do this is Jeffrey Hudsonberg. He's an ardent advocate for the Kwekwe language and a vibrant force striving for its revival and recognition. Um, hi, Jeffrey. You're welcome to Africa's LSP podcast. We are delighted to have you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Right. So let's start with you telling us a bit about yourself. I mean, who you are, where you're from, where you're based, what you do, etc. Thanks for that question, Nate, about identity. My name is Jeffrey Uwasi Watakobatsenberg. For my maternal side, I am from the Kohokwa Koi. For my paternal side, I am from the Namakoi. My original roots lies in the Autumn Tots Valley of the Western Cape in Namakoland in the Northern Cape. But I'm currently based in Naremepo, South Africa, in Klatmuts, a small hamlet on the outskirts of Stellenbosch in the Cape Winelands district. And what I do is I'm a Koiko language activist and a heritage preservationist. And also I also do Koiko language basic level phrases and basic level introduction on foundation phrase at a local primary and also I'm planning to have a local literature reading drive at a local library in my hometown. Right, so you're a Kwe Kwe language activist. Um, can you tell us what exactly drove you to, to go into Kwe Kwe language activism? Well, the reason that I became a Kwe Kwe language activist is because on a personal I can remember 12 years ago, just before my maternal uncle was passing on, he was lying on his deathbed and his famous last words that he said to me was, Jeffrey, my son, you must know who you are and where you come from. And that made me think, okay, society perceived me as a colored or even in quick way, there's a nice word to describe it, a brand, a nothing. And I thought to myself, wow, whoa, 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 <laughs> how can society be? How can society just erase you like that from the diaspora or the spectrum of society? In hindsight, I am not, and then actually tell me to make further introspection and research, but, well, I am not a coward, I am a coy person, and being a coy person, you must have that basic face or that basic foundation to say, if you are that person of that eyes or nation, you are supposed to have a whole vast world language that root you in Africa to say that this is my identity. And how has the journey been so far? I mean, how are people within the Khoi Khoi community and generally in South Africa taking um, this whole idea of Khoi Khoi language activism? Are people beginning to appreciate, um, accept, and then, and then learn the, the Khoi Khoi language? Interesting question about journeys. It's now 12 years, 13 years that I'm busy with Khoi Khoi activism. And on a grand scale, it is now 8 years that I'm busy with Khoi Khoi as a language. Because remember... Koiko is a language, it humbles you. It is not just like any other language that you just go and think seven days I will be fluent in the language. No. Koiko language is a language of quasi or respect. You have to respect the language. You don't come and say that, okay, I'm going to speak in two weeks or just one week. Five days I will fluent in this language. No. Can you do yourself a big error? You cannot say that. And also... Um, recently I was reading a book about the loss of language. What is the reason why we revitalize languages? Why do we 
when you revitalize the language, what does it do? And actually, it gives you silver down your spine. If you can read what a loss of language, loss of identity, loss of sense of belonging, loss of everything, what it does to you, it is a very true or a sad state of affairs. Because once you are stripped of language, then you are a nothing. Nobody thinks actually anything about you. And actually, it's a deep process, but many times in this journey, many people ask me and it is like society perceives you to be, you must be de or un-Africanized if you are busy with koi language and koi as identity or self-identification that I am a koi person. But in one side, they call, um, someone once asked me, what am I doing in my free time? I say, well, I'm learn the kufas of my abuhan or the language of my ancestors koi koi and to my surprise or pull the same person said to me jeffrey what's the matter with you are you now trying to become like a darky and i told and i was like to the back of my head whoa how can you say if i want to speak koi koi and learn koi koi that i'm going to sound like a darky i mean like what kind of a paradigm of racist cast xenophobia is this to de-Africanize me because remember koi koi in its clicks alone it humbles you it gives you that sense of belonging that sense of identity and also for me on a personal level learning koi koi it's of kuri sen or self healing because what has been told for us what we have read what we have learned is that in this journey that how our Koi people have been disowned and dismantled and stripped of language, cults and identity. It's like a true survival genocide. Right, right. Awesome. So can you share with us some of the challenges associated with um, promoting the Koi Koi language, um, both in South Africa and, and around the world? And, and how are you addressing these obstacles? Can you imagine that, night? That indeed there are Many challenges in a koi spectrum, for example, the biggest challenge is there is a new phenomenon in South Africa where you get suddenly out of the blue, you get some people that come and pretend and give their, um, what's the, I cannot come to that English word, but I'm going to just keep it straightforward. Um, they come to the party and, figuratively speaking now, not like in physically a party and literally <laughs> nobody just come in proclaim i am a king i am a paramount chief i am a headman and i'm like well, how can you do so this is the challenge money or money is the main cause that people nowadays in the koi community did you get even the so-called middle class colored society that just want to come and jump onto the bandwagon and come and say that we are chiefs, we are kings, and even now you get the talks. They, they just come, I want to put a leopard skin over my body, I'm going to wear a, a headpiece, a cultural headpiece, and just pray, and I'll call myself a king, a chief, a prince, or whatever, because government is going to sort me out financially, and that is challenge. Number two, whenever we have in south or spaces, comes or conversations about the koi, you tend to get this, this tendency of people who try to ignore or silence you. I know for a fact, me and many, many people at grassroots level that do this work, we know that you have to research your stuff thoroughly before you want to utter things and you want to say stuff. And even for example, I know for a fact, Nate, you probably saw in our off-the-air conversation that we had, that you saw on my Facebook profile that I am an artist and whatever, but I noticed you probably saw on my social media that I also posted advocate about the challenges of cars in our Koi communities. For example, how many of our Koi people in county districts on the so-called Cape Flats and so on in the flat courts and blocks, what challenges are on a daily basis there that we face? And then on the other hand, then you get the middle class colored community. And also, the most shocking part is, for me on a personal level, what I, what I once experienced was that even 
people tend to think that koi work is a esoterical thing, that certain people can talk about it, and when they talk about it, they can just rent their mouth and you, and I know you probably saw a picture of me, that even there's a certain standard of how koi people can look like and who are able to talk about it. And I'm like, no man, please, 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 don't make this an esoterical thing. Make it an open thing. Because even the other day I was talking to a guy koi or elder, and he told me, Jeffrey, that what is the definition of a non-wise person? Is a person that tried to make a point, but he doesn't make his point. He just go, he goes with the flow, and when it affects him, he or she wants to utter and try to play the victim. And that's probably the most biggest challenge that we face. Why do you want to know or silence a person that advocates for the truth? Because don't get me wrong, if you advocate for language, language is a broader thing. There's many things in language that is that can be discussed, like identity. Identity even is broad because now it is also another challenge that is faced is why is it that in South Africa, for example, that what type are you are being seen as a as a great worth thing? For example, if you read in the newspapers you see in South Africa, according to traditional affairs, five tribes in South Africa gets recognition from the South African government, the Nama, the Kurana, the Griqua, the Sun, and the Cape Koi, and I'm like, Cape Koi, you cannot, I know for a fact, there is 15, in the southern western Cape region, there are 15 types of the Koi, and you cannot just juxtapose everybody under one umbrella and call it a Cape Koi, because it's not going to work like that, and even, white people are always, just referring to the tribe is because we all know the problem in South Africa in history. What is being perceived, perceived, what is the koi? How the koi look and what has been said, it's that true or painful thing that still haunts us. And it's the biggest elephant in the room. Also, you will rather see a person and even, is it that I'm trying to sound? to conclusions or point fingers, but even certain groups or tribes think that they are, it is a social status because it affiliates you to a certain political party in South Africa and that is, that is the rotten part where everything comes together and that is what I told you now, the few challenges that we face, but it's a work in progress, we're at grassroots level, we do our best to make sure that people understand and get a better understanding what is this about and why is everything so. Great. Now, let's delve deeper into the language proper. Um, Jeffrey, can you share the history behind the Khoi Khoi language with us? I mean, its origin and the part of the world where it is spoken. Now we are getting to a point. The history of the Khoi Khoi language, well, Khoi Khoi language is as old as humankind because remember how the world evolved how everything evolved, Khoi Khoi as a language is still here. Actually, for a fact, yesterday evening I was reading also a book that said, even before from the 6th or the 7th century, when civilization was being implemented, even now we can see Khoi Khoi is the mother of mother tongues. Every language, Bantu or non-Bantu languages, each words and phonetic and monographical wording and dialects and everything, Everything is rooted back to Koiko, so how can you go? Koiko is the mamas of mamas who was or the mother of mother tongues. You get it. Right. Are there any varieties of the language? If yes, we'll be glad if you can share them with us. Well, another interesting question. The varieties of Koiko, there are a lot, but another challenge in the varieties of Koiko. Why are we always trying to say that Koiko is Nama? Griqua language or Kora. It's not right. It's everything. It's Koi Koi. It's under the same umbrella. Even for a record, <laughs> for an interesting thing, six again, um, I'm reading a lot about these things and I came to a little um, 
study that if you break down even the Quran language, that if you listen to the words and you read it, it is the same as similar to Nana. It's basically quite cool. So why is it that they must be made a book out of it? No, it's challenge after challenge after challenge. We get these things. And also, lastly, Koi Koi is, a, is an umbrella language, the main language, just the others that the varieties that people try to say it's the major language, it's not like that. It's just a dialect under the main umbrella named Koi Koi. Even for fact that Amopi is another problematic case, but I'm not going to divulge into that because the name Koi Koi is just a story for another day, but we won't. We have a conversation about what's going on in Namibia. We just focus in here as in the Republic of South Africa or Narema. Great, Jeffrey. I'm I'm curious to know what what is the estimated number of people that speak the Koyko language in South Africa and around the world. And um, in your opinion, do you think this number is growing or decreasing over time? Thanks for that question. And the estimated number of speakers can you imagine that it's growing? In my opinion. Because I don't believe this that they say with elders die the language died. No, it doesn't work like that. It's an everyday if we go into details and we learn words, we create new words, we create music, we write poetry and everything. We are speakers of the language. And for your question that you ask, the Koi language or the Koi language Approximately, there are 4,500 or more speakers in South Africa. The so-called Sun language, there is 2,700 to 2,950,000 2, speakers at the current moment, or even if State South Africa releases its language report here, we will probably see it will increase. Great. So, um, I saw this several weeks ago and and i think this is the perfect opportunity to ask you this um i've come across several social media pages and posts in recent times that um seek to push for the koi koi language to be made an official language of south africa um can you tell us more about this i mean what's this about um now we're going to face the elephant in the room koi koi for almost 30 years has never been made a south african official language is still a language that is still to be, it's not official, but it's a spoken language. And that is why the problem that I personally have, how can you say that the language must be preserved if you don't do your part as a government? Nothing has been done. And even the 16th of June this year, South Africa will have 26 years of constitution which states in section 6, article amendment 1 and annex 2, that all Khoi San and all other indigenous fragile and extinct languages must be reloved, preserved, and kept for future generations. And I'm like, what? You do one thing and you say another thing in a document because the document stuff don't get implemented what you say, what you are doing. So, and even what is so annoying is that if you look at the South African coat of arms, the Saku or the dialect of rural language is predominantly on the T E A K, which means unity in diversity. So what unity in diversity is there if the mother of mother languages isn't even official in your country? It's a painful thing. And I hope that our government will do at least something and just stop have talk because we all know talk is cheap. Right. Um, before we leave, Jeffrey, let me give you the opportunity to talk briefly about this year's Koi Koi Language Week celebration and um, your plans for promoting the Koi Koi Language Week in the upcoming year. Thanks for the question. Our act of contributions is our plans for 2024 is our theme is the same theme as for this year in the International Koi Koi Language Week, 
see that cook see that who was or our land our language that is our theme that we are heading for this year that's coming because remember we are now in the fourth or third year of the decade of indigenous languages by the united nations unesco arm wonderful wonderful one more question before we leave you spoke about several challenges um of the of the koiko language and um i want to ask you this what what support or collaboration from governmental or non-governmental entities do you believe is is crucial to advancing the recognition and teaching of the koiko language in south african schools interesting and do you get what i'm going to mean now what i'm going to tell you now support is crucial for ngos because NGOs are like custodians of the society. How can you say that society in the broader public as an NGO is one of your targets, but yet you don't do things on grassroots level that are there for you to preserve stuff and to make sure that people are aware what is going on, even teaching in government schools. I have experienced from last year and this year that at the local primary school I was giving after school basic phrases from the Koikoi language reader to the children grade 6 to grade 7 about the foundation phase of Koikoi and it was interesting the kids loved it and everything but the thing is your time frame 30 minutes after school and yet there comes another thing Koikoi is not official so how we going to do things if we are not official so that means that it won't be prioritized and that is the problem. Can you imagine that? But how they got up? Oh, we are here. Everything is going good. We are going well. And for the third year of international languages decade, we are going good. Yeah, that is the thing. We all go, but things must just come to a point where government and NCOs must play their part. Like I said previously, they cannot come and just say this and that, but on the other hand, you do nothing, you do the opposite of what you talk, or it's just, 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 just cheap political gimmicks. Because remember, next year we have a general election in South Africa, so things will be set to make to believe that our promises will be fulfilled, but no. 30 years, 26 years, it's still the same old story. Uh -uh. I don't know anymore. Great, great, great. It's been wonderful discussing the Koiko language with you, Jeffrey. Um, thank you so much for sharing your language and your, and your, and your heritage with us. Um, as usual, we'll be sharing your, your social media details with our audiences so they can engage further. Um, thanks again for your time and contribution, Jeffrey. Yeah, thanks a lot. Tamatic ownership, no problem. And Sadatasi Uhare comes up. We need to have these conversations because these conversations make us who we are. And also, we must take each other's hands so that we can just go and make things happen. And I thank you, Nate. Thank you very much for this opportunity. And I hope when we talk again that all these things will come into action and not just words. Kaisi Gangans. Kai Ayos. Thanks for tuning in to Africa's LSP podcast. We hope you enjoyed the conversation and learned something new. For feedback or inquiries, reach out to us at podcast at bolingoconsult.com. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review us on your favorite platforms. Until next time, stay curious and keep growing.